Paul Rubens, the actor and comedian best known for his portrayals of the character Pee Wee Herman. Funny tonight, remembering actor Paul Rubens, who created the whimsical, beloved character Pee Wee Herman. Paul Rubens, widely recognized as the enigmatic Pee Wee Herman, known for his distinctive high-pitched voice and hilariously childish antics. George? Pee Wee? has gone through tremendous changes and development, both highs and lows in his career. In his video, we'll celebrate his humor, but also delve into the controversies that occasionally shadowed him off stage. Brace yourselves as we navigate the Rubens' stormy life, including his notorious arrest, its far-reaching consequences, and sad end. Let's unravel the complexity and unpredictability of Paul Rubens' captivating persona. Early life and rise to stardom. Paul Rubens, formerly known as Paul Rubenfeld, was born on August 27, 1952, in Peekskill, New York. His early life was enriched by a vibrant cultural environment. His parents, Judy and Milton Rubenfeld, fostered his love for diverse forms of entertainment, and one of the most memorable experiences of his childhood was attending the annual Ringling Bros and Barnum and & Bailey Circus. Upon his family's relocation to Sarasota, Florida, a multitude of his neighbors happened to be talented performers for the renowned Ringling Brothers Circus. As a result, Paul wasted no time in becoming a regular attendee of their captivating shows. It is clear that these influences played a significant role in shaping his unique and endearing personality. Against his parents' initial objections, he followed his passion for entertainment, starting with backyard plays and eventually making his way to a local theater. From a young age, Rubens developed a keen interest in performance and spectacle, which would go on to shape his lifelong fascination with the captivating world of showbiz. He admired the young actor Ron Howard while he was growing up. After high school graduation, he attended Plymouth State University for one semester, before attending Boston University, after which he began auditioning for acting schools. He was turned down by several schools, all right, all right. I'll wait. including the Juilliard School and twice by Carnegie Mellon University, before being accepted to the California Institute of the Arts. Rubens moved to California, where he worked in restaurant kitchens and as a fuller brush salesman. Following his relocation to California in the 1970s, Rubens decided to further his education in drama at the prestigious California Institute of the Arts. At this point, he started honing his performance style and refining his comedic timing. His interest in comedy eventually led him to become a member of the highly respected improvisational comedy group, The Groundlings. Rubens refined his skills and created a variety of characters for their sketch comedy routines within this talented collective. Pee Wee Herman emerged during this period of creative churn, quickly capturing the hearts of people across the nation. During a Groundlings show, the cast portrayed various characters commonly found in a comedy club. Paul, on the other hand, wasn't particularly fond of doing stand-up comedy. His routines and characters tended to lean towards the absurd. He decided to portray his character as a struggling comedian who struggled to deliver jokes and come up with witty comebacks to hecklers. Pee Wee Herman didn't become a sensation overnight, despite his iconic laugh, eccentric gray suit, and oversized red bow tie. On the contrary, the character underwent a gradual evolution. Rubens meticulously honed Pee Wee through numerous performances, carefully refining the details that would eventually become the defining features of his now legendary act. In 1981, The Pee Wee Herman Show, a stage production featuring the character, received widespread critical acclaim as a result of his unwavering dedication. After achieving great success, Rubens decided to pursue his next venture in Hollywood. Rubens teamed up with the talented Tim Burton to bring Pee Wee to life on the big screen in 1985 with Pee Wee's Big Adventure. The film turned out to be a great success, bringing new and exciting opportunities for both Rubens and his lovable alter ego. The stage show had a successful run of five months and even had one of its performances recorded and aired as an HBO special in 1981. This film was highly successful and set the stage for the 1985 movie Pee Wee's Big Adventure and the popular show Pee Wee's Playhouse. Rubens' work had a distinctiveness that set it apart, just like his approach. At a 2016 question and answer session held at USC's Ray Stark Family Theater, Wayne White, an artist involved in the production of Pee Wee's Playhouse, expressed his gratitude towards Rubens for taking a risk on him and allowing him the freedom to fully unleash his creative potential. White mentioned that they were performing their tasks for the first time. Who would have given us a chance in Hollywood? No one. Paul was incredibly impressive. Not only was he an artist himself, but he also had a knack for discovering talented unknowns. The Playhouse, 
had an incredible impact as an art project that unexpectedly made its way onto television. Career Break In the 1970s, Rubens began performing at local comedy clubs and starting in 1977, made 14 guest appearances on The Gong Show, four of which as part of a boy-girl act he had developed with Charlotte McGuinness called The Hilarious Betty and Eddie. He soon joined the Los Angeles-based improvisational comedy team, The Groundlings. He remained a troupe member for six years, working with Bob McClurg, John Paragon, Susan Barnes, and Phil Hartman. Hartman and Rubens became friends and often wrote and worked on material together. In 1980, Rubens had a small part as a waiter in the Blues Brothers. Fast forward to a couple of years later. After being rejected from Saturday Night Live, Paul believed that his comedy career had come to an end. As he contemplated returning to his hometown of Sarasota, a memory resurfaced of the peculiar comedian character he once portrayed, which had gained significant popularity a few years ago. Perhaps there was something present. He borrowed money from his parents and collaborated with fellow groundlings Phil Hartman and John Paragon to bring the Pee Wee character back to life in his own stage show. They took inspiration from 50s children's shows like Howdy Doody and transformed the character's rebellious nature into that of a timeless child, blending in elements of delight, awe, and of course, absurdity. The Pee Wee Herman show centers around the adventures of a young boy named Pee Wee, who resides in a whimsical playhouse located in Puppetland. He engages with the audience in a playful manner, treating them as if they are young viewers who have joined his show. He also interacts with cozy characters such as Terry the Pterodactyl, Captain Carl, and Miss Yvonne. The play was crafted with the intention of entertaining the Groundlings crowd by parodying a children's show. It cleverly incorporated a multitude of adult humor and subtle suggestions of a more mature nature. At the conclusion of the show, after an hour of engaging educational segments and delightful audience participation, Jombie the Genie fulfills Pee-wee's wish to fly. Hello, Pee-wee. Hi, Terry. Hey, you been flying, huh? The grand finale is a captivating musical number, during which Pee-wee joyfully declares himself to be the luckiest boy in the world. Just picture yourself attending a spontaneous comedy show and witnessing something like this. I would be absolutely amazed. The play debuted in 1981 with midnight performances at the Groundlings Theater, captivating a somewhat perplexed yet largely enamored audience. Its avant-garde style received high praise from critics, who also commended its unique set design. Paul Rubens was hailed as one of the most eccentric comedians in the industry. It gained a dedicated cult following and became immensely popular, leading to a five-month sold-out run at the Roxy Theater in Los Angeles. The show was even filmed by HBO as a comedy special, propelling Pee Wee into the mainstream. At this juncture, Paul made the decision to fully embrace the Pee Wee Herman persona, leaving behind his real name. He began making frequent appearances on TV shows, movies, and even became a regular guest on Late Night with David Letterman. Letterman once amusingly commented, What I find hilarious is that it has the appearance of a mischievous and clever child, but deep down, you know it's being controlled by something sinister. Pee Wee Herman, with his constant presence and unique comedic style, unexpectedly emerged as an iconic figure of absurdity during that era. This iconic character was so beloved that Warner Brothers even decided to create a full-length feature film based on it. During this period, there was a prevalent trend of creating movies centered around a single comedic character. Films that excelled in portraying comedic characters on the screen were far less prevalent. How can one transform this vibrant and passionate individual into the protagonist of a captivating 90-minute film? Paul attempted to answer that question in an office located on the Warner Brothers studio lot. It's worth noting that he had no prior experience in writing screenplays. This movie faced a challenging situation. As Paul was in the middle of writing his first draft, his attention was suddenly drawn to something outside his office. Bicycles. Yes, you heard that right. It is quite common to witness employees effortlessly biking around studio backlots, swiftly making their way to their desired set or office. Paul playfully inquired about receiving his own bike from Warner Brothers, and to his delight, they surprised him with a beautifully restored 1940 Schwinn. He fell in love immediately. Paul decided to discard his initial draft and teamed up with collaborators Phil Hartman and Michael Varhall to embark on a fresh script centered around the theme of biking. With this new script, 
The search began to find a director who could capture the unique blend of Pee Wee's humor and heart. Paul attended a screening of Frankenweenie, a short film made by Disney, in 1984. It was hosted by his friend Shelley Duvall. He was confident that the director chosen would be the ideal person to bring Pee Wee to life on the screen. Warner Brothers saw the potential and took a chance by hiring a promising newcomer named Tim Burton. Burton enhanced the kitsch style and absurd humor of the Pee Wee stage show by incorporating nightmare sequences, stop-motion animation, and distinctive set design into the film. These elements seamlessly complemented the world of Mr. Herman. Paul had a unique idea when it came to choosing the composer for this grand story. He wanted the frontman of his favorite band, Oingo Boingo. After attending a few concerts, Burton agreed, and rock star Danny Elfman reluctantly accepted the challenge of composing his first-ever film score. It's truly a remarkable coincidence, everyone. The unique perspectives of these artists came together to create the cinematic debut of an unexpected hero. The film quickly gained a dedicated cult following. Much like its beloved character, Pee Wee Herman, it received praise from critics and remained in the top three at the box office for six consecutive weeks. Although it didn't surpass its competition, a movie featuring a time-traveling DeLorean managed to earn an impressive $40 million with a modest $7 million budget. Parked my bike and when I came back, it was gone. Well, can you think of anyone who might have wanted to take it? Since then, it has gained a dedicated following and is considered a cult classic. Warner Brothers recognized the success of Tim Burton's film and extended an offer for him to direct another movie, which turned out to be the iconic Beetlejuice. This opportunity marked the beginning of Burton's illustrious career as one of Hollywood's most esteemed directors, a position he continues to hold today. Danny Elfman has consistently provided the musical backdrop for nearly all of Burton's films, lending his talents to over 100 Hollywood projects. Pee Wee utilized the movie's triumph to rejuvenate his original stage play into a bona fide morning kids show that appealed to audiences of all ages, Pee Wee's Playhouse. This show garnered an impressive 15 Emmys and solidified the character's status as a beloved figure in pop culture. In 1985, Pee Wee Herman had the opportunity to host his own episode of Saturday Night Live, which was a remarkable achievement, considering that Paul Rubens had previously been turned down for a spot on the cast. That's the way the entertainment industry works, my friend. At first glance, a Pee Wee Herman movie seemed unlikely to succeed. The film was a comedy made on a limited budget, directed by a newcomer in the industry. The score was composed by a first-time movie composer, and the script was written by aspiring screenwriters. The story revolved around a character who had never experienced the spotlight of a leading role, whether on television or in a major film. However, it is interesting to note that those very aspects played a crucial role in its success. Paul Rubens crafted a story that introduced Pee Wee to a wider audience, ensuring that the humor would resonate with both fans of the stage show and newcomers alike. Paul made a bold choice by selecting talented up-and-comers as the director and composer for the project. These individuals brought their distinct styles to the table, resulting in a truly artistic and captivating story. Pee Wee's Big Adventure is not only hilarious, but it also serves as a nostalgic glimpse into the creative minds of a group of young artists. The large marge I was riding with was... Ghost. And that's the story of how Pee Wee, a young boy, transitioned from performing on stage to making it big in the movies. Paul Rubin's creation, Pee Wee Herman, is a character who resonates with some people and irritates others. Paul developed the persona to represent a comedian without insight, a man who could not understand how the world perceived him. Pee Wee Herman was trapped in a never-ending cycle of clumsiness and uncomfortable situations. His squeaky voice and bizarre mannerisms attracted both positive and negative attention. One could argue that Pee Wee Herman was really a clown, which makes sense based on where Paul gained inspiration. Paul felt like an oddball, so he created a socially awkward character who would never hide behind normal behavior. In a sense, Pee Wee Herman was authentic. He could always be his true self, not bound by the rules of etiquette or common sense. The corny and cartoonish behavior of Pee Wee Herman allowed audiences to celebrate childhood experiences. Pee Wee Herman would never truly mature. His childlike persona connected with both children and adults. He acted like a child, which children liked, and he was an adult who refused to grow up, which some adults enjoyed. The Pee Wee Herman character was novel, catchy, and amazingly successful. Some people, however, suspected there was a darker side to this cheerful character. They were suspicious of the man behind Pee Wee Herman. Regular size? Mm, no. <gasps> no! 
<laughs> Paul Rubin's arrest. Paul appeared in a follow-up to Pee-wee's big adventure called Big Top Pee-wee in 1988. This second version didn't perform as well as the first, but it still managed to generate a profit. The television show Pee-wee's Playhouse concluded in 1990. Paul expressed his desire to explore new projects due to his current state of burnout. In July 1991, Paul had a life-altering encounter with law enforcement that would have a profound impact on his career. In 1991, Rubin's rise to fame came to an abrupt halt when he visited an adult movie theater in Sarasota and was reportedly caught engaging in inappropriate behavior. He was apprehended by a police detective during an unannounced inspection of the theater while he was in the lobby. Rubens entered a plea of no contest to the charges. He insisted on his innocence, later sharing with Stone Phillips on Dateline NBC. It didn't appear to be a crime in my eyes. I never considered the potential consequences of entering this place and getting arrested. Despite the cancellation of Pee Wee's Playhouse, CBS decided to halt the reruns of the show after the arrest. In 2002, Rubens faced charges of possessing child pornography, although his publicist vehemently denied the allegations, stating that they were baseless. The actor's representative clarified that the images in question were sourced from an extensive historical art photography collection, which also included vintage erotica. According to The Village Voice, the district attorney conducted an investigation and ultimately determined that there was no case. In 2004, the actor faced serious charges related to child pornography, but ultimately, those charges were dropped. Instead, the actor pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of obscenity, as determined by the Los Angeles city attorney. As a result, the actor was placed on three years probation. His probation. Paul pleaded no contest to the charge in November 1991. As part of his plea agreement, he was required to complete 75 hours of community service. And fortunately, the charge would not be reflected on his permanent criminal record. Opinions about Paul Rubens were divided among the public. He received significant backing from prominent figures in Hollywood, including Bill Cosby and Zsa Zsa Gabor. According to some individuals, he was accused of a crime that did not harm anyone, and Paul became the focus of a society with strict moral beliefs. Some individuals had doubts about Paul's character, and were less inclined to be forgiving. Concerns arose regarding the possibility that his behavior was indicative of a broader pattern of inappropriate desires. Paul took a break from the limelight for a period, but he did take on a few minor roles in films and had a regular part on the TV show Murphy Brown from 1995 to 1997. In 2001, he was hired as the host of a game show, but unfortunately, it was canceled after only six episodes due to its poor reception. In November of 2002, Paul faced another arrest, which tarnished his reputation and hindered his career progress. This time, the charges were related to the possession of inappropriate images involving minors. Paul received a plea agreement in March 2004. He admitted to a misdemeanor charge of possessing obscene material. As a result, the more serious charge was dropped. Paul was required to adhere to certain restrictions for the next three years. These included obtaining permission from parents or guardians before being in the company of minors and registering his address with the sheriff's office. As part of his probation, it was required that he have a guardian present whenever he was around minors. Rubens appeared to embrace the controversy that became intertwined with his career. Paul was able to avoid the worst outcomes of his actions, and surprisingly, his second arrest didn't harm his career as much as the first one did. Paul asserted that he possessed an extensive assortment of vintage photographs and believed that the state was unfairly passing judgment. Despite the concerns raised by critics, Paul continued to be cast in various shows in Hollywood, which only seemed to reinforce their earlier reservations about his behavior. There was a feeling that his Hollywood supporters, especially, were hesitant to acknowledge any potential misjudgment regarding Paul Rubens. In 2004, during an interview with Stone Phillips, he expressed that people may perceive him in various ways, regardless of whether it is positive or negative. That's perfectly acceptable. Rest assured, I want to clarify any misconceptions you may have about me. I am not a pedophile. That statement is incorrect. As reported by Variety, Rubens had two exciting Pee Wee Herman projects in progress at the time of his passing. The Pee Wee Herman story and Pee Wee's Playhouse, the movie. The last film he directed was Pee Wee's Big Holiday, which was released on Netflix in 2016. Rubens served his probation and paid a $100 fine. The judge assigned to the case also ruled that Rubens had to participate in a year-long counseling program. The comic actor would then go on to make dozens of guest appearances in movies and TV shows, including Buffy the Vampire Slayer, 30 Rock, and Batman Returns. In 2010, he starred in a Broadway production of The Pee Wee Herman Show,
life and career post-arrest. After Rubin's arrest, he chose to retreat from the public eye and focused on diligently rebuilding his career. His hard work paid off as he slowly returned to acting, sometimes using different names, in a wide range of film and television projects. Rubens showcased his talent for voice acting in these projects. He brought animated characters to life in films like Disney's Hercules and Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas. During this phase of his career, he demonstrated the extent of his talents by venturing beyond the shadow of Pee Wee and delving into uncharted artistic realms. In 1999, Rubens was prepared to make a comeback, but this time in a completely different role that was a departure from his well-known Pee Wee character. His performance in the superhero parody film Mystery Men was highly acclaimed, signifying a significant milestone in his career. During the early 2000s, Rubens expanded his range of work, showcasing his talent in notable television shows like Reno 911 and making appearances in movies like Blow. Rubens continued to explore new roles while keeping Pee Wee Herman as a constant presence in his creative journey. In 2010, Rubens revived Pee Wee on stage with a Broadway adaptation of The Pee Wee Herman Show. A successful revival led to the release of a new Pee Wee film, Pee Wee's Big Holiday, on Netflix in 2016. In his later years, Rubens continued to captivate audiences with a diverse range of roles. He lent his unique voice to popular animated series such as Family Guy and Robot Chicken. He took on more intense and complex characters in hit TV shows such as The Blacklist and Gotham, showcasing a new side of his acting talent. Talent. Rubens enthusiastically embraced these diverse opportunities while also maintaining the essence of Pee Wee Herman. He made significant contributions by working on Pee Wee themed merchandise, engaging in fan events, and exploring the possibility of a darker reboot for Pee Wee's Playhouse. These efforts not only maintained the character's relevance, but also showcased Rubens's steadfast dedication to his distinct style of comedy. Paul Rubens's talent as a performer shone through in both the best and worst of times, captivating audiences with his unique artistry and leaving them delighted, amused, and inspired. Cameos and Guest Appearances Rubens has made appearances in a wide range of projects, adding his unique touch to each one. He portrayed Rick, a member of the Citizens Patrol, on the well-known Comedy Central series Reno 911. This role led to a minor part in the 2007 film Reno 911, Miami. In 2006, he made an appearance in the second music video for the raconteur's song, Steady As She Goes. In the video, the band participates in a hilarious soapbox car race, where Rubens takes on the role of the mischievous antagonist who tries to ruin the race. In 2007, Rubens attended a tribute event at the SF Sketchfest, where he engaged in a discussion about his career alongside Ben Fong Torres. In addition, he signed a deal with NBC to create a pilot for a sitcom called Area 57, which revolved around a passive-aggressive alien. Unfortunately, the show did not get picked up for the 2007 to 2008 season. Little, uh, what do you call it, saucer. Mm -hmm. I'm getting so excited just yeah, thinking yeah. about it right now. Rubens also made an appearance on the popular NBC series 30 Rock, where he portrayed an inbred Austrian prince. This unique character was brought to life by Tina Fey specifically for him. In addition, he had the opportunity to make three guest appearances on FX's series Dirt, portraying the character of Chuck LaFoon, a washed-up alcoholic reporter. On this occasion, he received a recommendation for the role from Courtney Cox, a star of the show Dirt, and a close friend. David Arquette, Cox's husband, later chose Rubens to star in his first film as a director, The Tripper, released in 2007. Rubens made a triumphant return as Pee Wee Herman at the Spike TV's Guy's Choice Awards in June 2007, marking his first appearance as the beloved character since 1992. Rubens has also made appearances in various Cartoon Network projects, including the 2006 television film Reanimated, as well as the animated series Chowder, Tom Goes to the Mayor, and Tim and Eric Awesome Show, Great Job. In 2008, Rubens was originally set to play the role of homeopathic antidepressant salesman Alfredo Aldericio in the third episode of Pushing Daisies. However, the role was ultimately given to Raul Esparza. Rubens also made an appearance as Oscar Vibanius in the seventh and ninth episodes of the series. In 2008, Rubens participated in a PSA for Unscrew America, a website promoting the use of energy-efficient light bulbs like CFLs and LEDs. In addition, he made an appearance in Todd Solondz's Life During Wartime. Rubens provided the voice for Batmite in The Batman, the brave and the bold episode Legends of the Dark Might in 2009. Paul Rubens' death. 
During his childhood in the 50s, Paul Rubens developed a strong fascination with television. He would eagerly watch popular shows such as I Love Lucy, The Mickey Mouse Club, Captain Kangaroo, and Howdy Doody. Rubens faced legal troubles after the end of his TV series, which unfortunately had a negative impact on his family-friendly image. However, his passing has served as a source of inspiration for his fans, who now reflect on his impressive multi-decade career. He passed away on July 30, 2023, from acute hypoxic respiratory failure at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. At the time of his death, he was diagnosed with both myelogenous leukemia and metastatic lung cancer. An official statement posted on his social media accounts read, in part, Paul bravely and privately fought cancer for years with his trademark tenacity and wit. A gifted and prolific talent, he will forever live in the comedy pantheon and in our hearts as a treasured friend and man of remarkable character and generosity of spirit. And a post signed by Rubens read, Please accept my apology for not going public with what I've been facing for the last six years. I have always felt a huge amount of love and respect from my friends, fans, and supporters. I have loved you all so much and enjoyed making art for you. Rubens' team released a pre-written statement from him, shedding light on his choice to keep his condition confidential. Rubens expressed regret for not sharing the challenges he has been dealing with over the past six years. I have always been grateful for the immense love and respect I receive from my friends, fans, and supporters. I have a deep affection for all of you and have taken great pleasure in creating art for you. Additionally, the team of Rubens shared the actor's last wish, which emphasized the importance of honoring his late parents, Judy and Milton Rubenfeld. Paul requested that any gestures of sympathy be directed towards Stand Up to Cancer or organizations dedicated to the care, support, and research of dementia and Alzheimer's. Rubens' passing has deeply saddened his fans, who are now reflecting on his life and cherishing the wonderful memories they have of his work. Many celebrities expressed their grief over the passing of Paul Rubens, a testament to the impact he had on their lives. Numerous stars had the privilege of working alongside him throughout his illustrious career. Cher bid farewell on her Twitter account, sharing a poignant line from Shakespeare's Hamlet. Conan O'Brien fondly recalled Paul Rubens, praising his incredible talent, kindness, creativity, and unique sense of humor. Actress Natasha Lyonne, who had the pleasure of working with him on Pee Wee's Playhouse when she was a child, expressed her deep affection for Paul. This is an all-time classic. I am grateful for the impact you have had on my career and for our enduring friendship throughout the years. Your ability to embody authenticity has been a valuable lesson for all of us. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more.